One of the cooler things about entertainment mediums is how they can inspire us or influence us in some great way within our lives. Seriously, go talk to anyone who works on movies, video games, cartoons, or whatever, and chances are they'll have one highly influential thing from one of those categories that put them on this path. You know, that thing that people say changed their life. There isn't always a single catalyst that pushes creators toward their field of choice, but it's always interesting to find out what made people get into something, or if there was something that changed their outlook on that genre in general. And it's even more interesting when the thing that did it is something you normally wouldn't expect. For example, if you've been watching my channel for a while, then you can probably guess that one of the things I gravitate towards the most in video games is character writing. Gameplay is hella important too, of course, and I don't believe that's really any excuse of why a game can't have both good writing and gameplay, but regardless, that's still the thing that often grabs my attention the most. I like learning about fictional characters and I like caring about them. With that in mind, you probably also know that I tend to gravitate towards RPGs, which are known for their intricate stories, developed characters, and lengthy game time. But what if I told you that the game that inspired me in regards to character writing, development, and caring about characters beyond just the pixels was about a silent protagonist. And even better, what if that game was an MMO? So this review is going to be a little bit different from what I normally do. I'll still cover all the usual points like gameplay and story, but seeing as how this game is a bit special to me as a person, it's going to be focused a lot more on how it personally influenced me and be a little bit more emotion driven. I'm not trying to be objective here is what I'm saying, not that I ever am, so just expect that. Also, I'm not going to worry about spoilers or anything, so be warned. This is Fantasy Star Online. Fantasy Star Online is a massive multiplayer online role-playing game developed by Sonic Team and published by Sega in the year 2000. Yes, Sonic Team did work on other games besides Sonic. It's weird, I know, I mean it's right in their name. It'd be like finding out that the Coca-Cola company also makes Sprite- wait, hold the phone. The game was originally developed and released for the Sega Dreamcast, though it's got a pretty interesting history in regards to its actual development. You see, back in the 80s and 90s, there existed this JRPG series made by Sega called Fantasy Star. It was a mixture of the science fiction and fantasy genres, dealing with generic JRPG protagonists fighting evil and saving the galaxy. To be honest, it sounds like something that would have been right up my alley, but I never actually played them. Years down the road, long after the release of the latest game in the series, Fantasy Star 4, Sonic Team was hard at work on a new series of projects. The Sega chairman at the time, Isao Okawa, believed that with recent advances in online capabilities and the internet, online gaming was about to become very important. Something that could later be chalked up to as the understatement of the century. Okawa asked Sonic Team to develop some console games focused on network play. This was a pretty tall and risky order considering that online gaming wasn't popular on consoles yet, but regardless, Sonic Team took on the task. They started working on a couple of different projects, including a game that focused on science fiction and fantasy elements. After the art director, Satoshi Sakai, drew some concept art for the game, including a dragon, the director of the Sonic Team, Yuji Naka, said that it reminded him of the Fantasy Star series, so they retooled the project in becoming a Fantasy Star MMO. And after that, the game was released in Japan for the Sega Dreamcast in 2000 and then North America in 2001. Later, they released an updated version with some additional features like a battle mode and a higher difficulty, and then they released a version for Windows. Then, they released an updated port with a new story episode to the GameCube after the Dreamcast failed and Sega was porting everything they had over there. And then a port was made for the Xbox, and then another updated version for the GameCube, and then a yet another updated version for Windows. So, yeah, this game went around the block in a short period of time. It also pretty much displaced the original Fantasy Star series completely. Most people who've heard of this series got into it with Fantasy Star Online now, and are usually surprised to find out that it actually started as a JRPG back on the Sega Master System in the late 80s. For me, my introduction to the series was with the first GameCube port. So, everything I'll be referencing in this video today is related to the GameCube version I originally played. So if I mention something that was not in another version of the game, 
That's why. Fantasy Star Online is a hack and slash MMO that focuses on blending science fiction and fantasy elements, which I have said at least three times now. On the one hand, you've got space elves and wizards who can shoot fireballs out of their hands, but then you've got space marine ass looking characters using rifles, shotguns, and rocket launchers, and then there's also the androids fighting with lightsabers. The game follows a pretty standard MMORPG formula. You start the game by creating a character based on a class and a race, with your character's attributes being affected by what they are. There's three races to choose from. Newmans, which are the aforementioned space elves with a higher affinity for techniques, the word for magic in this game, but tend to be more frail with their lower physical stats. Androids, or casts if you want to call them that, characters with superior physical stats but the inability to use techniques, instead of having to rely on their raw power and being able to lay traps, and of course the vanilla ice cream of fiction, humans, which tend to be a balanced mix of both, having decent physical stats and the ability to use techniques. There's also three classes to play as which seem to be based on the RPG archetypes of warrior, wizard, and archer, or in this case hunters, forces, and rangers. Hunters have high attack power and favor melee weapons, rangers have high accuracy and favor ranged weapons, and forces mostly use magic and wield fancy sticks. When I first played this game, I thought humans were boring and swords and robots were cool, so I ended up creating a male android hunter. I was also way into Gundam Wing at this point, since this was the early 2000s when the anime boom was at its peak, and since I saw some promotional material that depicted the Hugh cast using a scythe, I decided to paint my character black and name him Death Scythe. Although in the version I played for this video, they changed the number of characters you could use for your name, so I had to shorten it to Scythe instead. God damn it. After you create your character, the game throws you into the story. You find out you're some sort of mercenary on a ship full of refugees fleeing their doomed homeworld. The ship is called Pioneer 2, and if the name didn't tip you off, you find out that there was a Pioneer 1 that went on ahead of you guys to colonize a new homeworld. They succeeded and named that world Ragul. Problem is that upon making contact with Pioneer 2, there was a huge explosion down on the surface and all contact with Pioneer 1 has been lost. So, it's up to you to go down to the surface and find out what happened. Also, the president's daughter, a scientist and hunter on Pioneer 1 named Red Ring Rico, went missing. So you're supposed to find her as well. Since Fantasy Star Online is a hack and slash game, the gameplay is fairly straightforward and easy to understand. You load into an area and fight your way through monsters using a mixture of light and heavy attacks to whack them repeatedly until their health drops to zero and then they keel over, awarding you experience and loot before you move on to the next area. Then after going through a bunch of randomly generated levels, you fight a boss and you head back to the ship. Even the idea of team composition is simplistic. There's benefits to playing each class and having a balanced party for sure, but unlike more modern MMOs out there, there's nothing like a roll system in PSO. There's no dedicated healer, tank, or damage dealing class. Everybody is expected to pull their weight equally, and everybody is capable of taking care of themselves. And personally, I don't find the simplicity to be a bad thing. In fact, going back to this after playing modern MMOs was pretty refreshing since the game was more about skill and less about math. On its surface, the gameplay is incredibly simplistic and easy to understand, but if you dig a little bit deeper, there are some nuggets of depth. Your character can chain together three attacks in a row, but these attacks can be any mixture of light, heavy, or special attacks. Light attacks are quick and do decent damage, heavy attacks are stronger and knock the target back a little bit but are slower and have lower accuracy, and special attacks are unique abilities based on the weapon itself, which could be anything from inflicting fire damage on an enemy to stealing experience off of them. The way you chain these attacks together is actually pretty important to your strategy, especially if you're a melee fighter in this game. Your character gets slight boost to their attack accuracy based on which attack you're using at which point in the chain. Furthermore, different weapons have different animations with different speeds and different numbers of attacks. The way you time your attacks while approaching someone with a saber might be different with how you attack them with a broadsword or a mech gun. Not to mention taking into account how far each weapon propels you forward and how vulnerable you are after attacking, or how many enemies it actually hits. You don't have to go for the full 3 hit combo every time either. In fact, sometimes it's smart just to do a light and heavy attack and then back off to set up again. This kind of strategizing with your weapons does spice up combat quite a bit and keep you on your toes, but the only thing is that this kind of strategizing with your attacks only really applied to hunters in melee range. Rangers pretty much just move from spot to spot shooting someone at a long range with their gun like they're playing a Resident Evil game, and forces mostly rely on techniques which can never miss. 
The game says that hunters are the beginner class, but I always thought that the rangers were the easy class in this game. You having fun back there? Huh? Of course, being an RPG, your equipment does extend outside of your weapons as well. There's the basic role-playing stuff like armor and shields that increase your defense or healing items that you could carry on hand to patch yourself up when you get hurt. But the most standout piece of equipment in your arsenal was in the form of a little robot buddy that all characters had called a mag. Mags are an interesting stat-boosting piece of equipment in the form of a small robot that floats above your shoulder. A character has to raise a mag by giving them items that boost its stats and abilities, which in turn will boost the character stats and abilities. It's almost like someone on Sonic Team looked at the Chow Garden from Sonic Adventure and said, Hey, you know, for some reason everybody really loves this part of the game, so why don't we turn these little bastards into mechanical steroids? And I bring this up because I am convinced I am the only person on the planet that hated the Chow Garden. The cool thing about mags though is that it's more than just an adrenaline shot. They're also capable of helping you in combat by occasionally healing you, giving you an attack and defense boost, raising you from the dead, and probably other stuff that I've never seen or noticed because if I'm being honest, it's really inconsistent. But hey, they're there. They're helping. And don't you just love them? Mags were also capable of storing up energy over time and then unleashing it in a huge anime style attack called a Photon Blast, and what Photon Blast your character had access to depended on how you leveled up your mag. You can also find new mags to raise and create tons of different builds for the character based on which mag you have equipped. The most people would probably just go online and look up the best cookie cutter stat build and stick with that, such as the internet. Yeah, so all that's good and dandy, but at this point you're probably wondering what I was going on about earlier, about the character writing or whatever, and how this game influenced me. Why is this game so special to me? Well, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure myself, but I've got some ideas. It's funny, but my fondest memories of Fantasy Star Online aren't actually from the online part. Sure, it was a big deal when the game first came out, since console network play wasn't a widespread thing yet, but even then, me and my family had an extremely limited view on how online gaming actually worked. Most MMOs have a main storyline for your character to follow, and some of them are pretty damn good, but the single player experience in an MMO is not usually the mainstream appeal, nor is it what's typically marketed towards buyers. It's usually all about the online interaction, the relationships you build with complete strangers, and the camaraderie you form with each other as you endlessly grind for loot and virtual currency. And Fantasy Star Online definitely has that too, but even then, the things I look back on for this game came from playing it by myself or from playing it with my older brother. We spent hours on the weekend playing through an entire episode together, fighting our way through each zone and then fighting a larger than life boss at the end. And then we call it quits and do it all again a day or two later. I got really invested in the setting and story of Fantasy Star Online, to the point where I'd often write stories about my character going on adventures in my free time, or come up with different ideas for what was going on in his head and stuff like that. And years later, I would realize that what I was doing at the time was writing fanfiction about my OC. But it's not like I was crossing it over with anything weird, like Shrek or whatever, except for that one time. The actual single player story of Fantasy Star Online was pretty minimalistic all things considered. In fact, it was quite possible to just ignore the story completely and just focus on fighting monsters, leveling up, and collecting loot. The game was broken up into two episodes, episode 1 and 2. The first episode dealt with Pioneer 2's government hiring you to go down to Raggle and find out what happened to Pioneer 1. Along the way you could find messages left behind by Red Ring Rico, the principal's daughter, which give you a clue as to what happened and a bit more insight to the setting of Ragul and what Pioneer 1 went through before you arrived. Overall it was pretty minimalistic. It was possible to skip Rico's messages altogether, blow off the principal, and still play through the game just fine, save for one part where you had to activate three pillars to get into the final area. Episode 1 also had an entire series of side quests from an organization called the Hunter's Guild, where you were essentially rented out for a variety of tasks like a mercenary would be. Things like finding missing persons, data retrieval, and purchasing a cake from a shop that's located down in the pits of hell? These were all divorced from the main story and mostly self-contained, but there were several that formed their own miniature story arcs, and even some that dealt with the mystery of Pioneer 1's disappearance, so I enjoyed playing them. Episode 2 tried to amend all that by being a bit more story-driven with its main story, with your character now investigating a specific case on Ragul and searching for another hunter named Heathcliff Flowen, while trying to dig up some of the more shady X-File stuff that Pioneer 1 was really going through on Ragul. 
It also added a character named Ellie, with whom you held conversations with on the job and could feed you info on the enemies that you were fighting. Overall, the game tried to have more of a focused narrative and it was a lot easier to get invested in what was happening and what you were doing. But even with Episode 1's main side stories and Episodes 2 attempt at creating a more focused narrative, it was still pretty easy just to skip all of it and just play the game if you wanted to. Hell, when you beat either episode on single player, you don't even get any sort of closing cutscene. The game just goes to the credits and that's it. It's even funnier if you beat the game online where you won't watch the credits, but the theme music will play anyway, and you'll get a group shot of your current party that you're playing with doing heroic poses with the message, Congratulations, you are the hero. Yeah, look at us. We're awesome. Your actual character is a silent protagonist who might occasionally have the opportunity to give sass, but for the most part just kind of accepts everything that's thrown their way. And I've said it before, but I'm not a really a huge fan of completely silent protagonists in video games, depending on how it's handled. If they are going to be done, then I prefer them be a completely blank slate without some sort of pre-established family or friends or relationships. That way I can come up with my own story for this character without having any kind of prior influence. I got really attached to Death Scythe and Fantasy Star Online because since there was nothing to be known about him, I was able to come up with an entire backstory for him and be able to sort of make up what he was thinking about in every situation. I know that PSO wasn't the first game to do something like this, but it was one of the first games I had played where I could customize my character from mostly scratch and be put into that kind of situation. So it was influential for me. I made up a whole story about how he was an android that was built for combat but was slowly learning feelings and human emotions and my brother's character was ex-military and was his partner and sort of a buddy cop action flick and they fought crime together while investigating Ragul. But then when episode 2 rolled around he was chosen to lead the investigation because of his past deeds and you got your cute female operator named Ellie with whom he started dating and they were in love and <laughs> let's, not, let's not focus on that part actually never mind. I was super attached to this character and his story, the story that I was making up. The main appeal for the game was playing online with friends and strangers and hunting for loot and having a fun romp, not getting emotionally attached to a character with basically a blank canvas that you drew on. Yet that was what drew me in, and that's what I think about all those years later. Before PSO, I had never really paid attention to RPGs or characters or story. I found a lot of them to be boring and mostly just focused on action games that had a faster pace. But after PSO, I suddenly started getting more invested in video game characters and wanted to learn more about what made them tick as people. It's really weird that a character that was basically a virtual sock puppet is what got me into that. But there you go. Now, of course, by now, you're probably wondering if I actually did play the online content at all. And I did, but to be honest, I had more negative experiences than positive. You see, Sega's American branch really did not do a good job with running their English servers, and whether that's the fault of the company or who put them in charge, I'm not really sure. Hackers were rampant in Fantasy Star Online, and while some of them were doing things for just self-gain, like giving themselves ridiculously overpowered weapons and mags, there were quite a few that just spent all of their time griefing other players. One griefing tactic in particular was something called Frozen Screen of Deathing, or FSOD for short. Basically what would happen was that a hacker would do something to make your game freeze up, at which point you'd have to force a restart. And that's pretty annoying already, but the worst part about it was that when you force quit from a game in PSO without using the menu, you would lose all the items in your inventory aside from the ones he had equipped. And there was no way to get them back. I'm the type of player that keeps a weapon for every occasion, and by the time I had ventured online, I had collected quite a few rare weapons that I had grown attached to. And that's when, on my very first day of playing, I was FSOD'd, and those weapons were all lost. Thankfully I managed to get duplicates of them after a while, and even outgrew several by leveling up, but it didn't change the fact that it was devastating to lose that special sword that you'd had for so long. You know, the one that you would put into your bank to keep forever, even though you'll never use it again because it's so much weaker than what you've got now? I quickly learned that if you were going to play online, you should take only one weapon and just stick with it while hoping your teammates can cover your back and fill in your weaknesses. So, in a way, it was a lesson about trust. That being, don't trust anyone for fear that they're a hacker. Most of the time I would instead play on the Japanese servers because there were far fewer hackers there, but while there were several very nice Japanese players that didn't mind playing with English speakers, there were still a lot that would flat out refuse to play with you if you were an American. 
Most Japanese players didn't speak English, but just about all of them learned how to say the phrase JP only. It would spam it constantly at you once they found out where you were from. And part of it was because the language barrier and how it was too frustrating to try and communicate using the in-game translator chat system. It makes sense, I guess. PSO isn't the type of game where you gotta discuss tactics with your team or anything, but it's nice to be able to communicate with your party about little things like deciding where you want to go or just having a casual conversation. But the other reason was that American players had such a terrible reputation online for being hackers and FSO deers that nobody wanted to play with them. It didn't matter if you were a legit player or even a nice person. Most people didn't want to take the risk. It was fun seeing the cultural differences in how Japanese players and American players played though. For one thing, Japanese players would do this thing where they would take any rare items they found during a game and drop it in front of the bank on Pioneer 2. The idea was that after they were done playing, they'd go and divvy up the loot amongst themselves, deciding on who gets what based on who needs slash wants it the most. I actually got in a bit of trouble once or twice when I played with some Japanese players when I first saw this because I assumed they were just items that nobody wanted so I'd always take them for myself since most Americans had a first come first serve basis for loot. And eventually someone who spoke English corrected me so I stopped doing it. Uh, unless I was having a bad day and someone spammed JP only at me so I'd steal all their crap before leaving. Guess I wasn't doing a whole lot to sway that asshole American stereotype by doing that, huh? There was also how Japanese players would save all their photon blasts and fire them off together when they weren't in a fight. Apparently they just did this because they thought it looked cool to use them all together, whereas American players would mostly just use them in battle in a more practical fashion. There was a gameplay mechanic that lets you boost photon blasts by using them together like this, but the Japanese players didn't seem to care. They just used them this way regardless if someone had the Olsen twins to boost your attack and defense. But despite all that interesting cultural exchange, I kinda didn't care about the online component of Fancy Star Online. Sure, it was fun for what it was, but after getting FSOD several times and told to f**k off by Japanese players, I ended up going back to the single player enjoying myself just fine. I even managed to eventually get what was hands down my favorite weapon in the game, the chainsaw. A massive chainsaw broadsword that had a unique sound effect when you swung it. God, I want that thing back so bad. But sadly, all good things must come to an end. And the unthinkable happened. The memory card that had death size data on it got corrupted. It was one of those 1000 megabyte memory cards too, so we had a ton of game data on there from not just PSO but a bunch of other stuff. All of it? Lost. After all those hours and days and weeks of adventuring, fighting monsters, collecting loot and searching for Pioneer 1, Death Scythe's journey finally came to an end. Not with a bang, but with an error screen. I guess the most straightforward thing to do at that point would have been just to start over, remake Death Scythe from scratch, go on another adventure and enjoy our time together again. But when faced with the daunting task of recreating a character that you've had for what seemed like a lifetime, it kind of deters you a bit. I put PSO away after that, not playing for years before I ended up losing the game, probably either by misplacing it or trading away like an idiot. And it didn't really matter though because eventually PSO shut down its servers, just like all online games will eventually do once interest in the game is waned or the company just doesn't want to support it anymore due to the financial reasons. That's not to say that the legacy of Fantasy Star stopped there though. No sir. The game actually got a direct sequel exclusive for the GameCube called Episode 3 Card Revolution, a card battle game set 50 years after Episode 2. I ended up playing it because it was PSO, but man did I hate it. It just wasn't the same and didn't represent the game it was based on at all. I'm so confused as to why they went this route in the first place when they thought people would like it. Like why? Was it because card games were big at the time it came out? They're not even real cards, you can't buy them, there's no merchandise to be made off this. Later though, before the servers were shut down, Sega released an updated version of PSO for Windows called Blue Burst, which added a brand new episode called Episode 4. Duh. It was set between Episodes 2 and 3 with a new area, enemies, and weapons, but adding almost nothing to the narrative. 
After that, the game got a spiritual successor in the Fancy Star Universe series, which was another console-based online hack and slash, similar to Fancy Star Online, and with several games for consoles and the PSP. It got another spiritual successor called Fancy Star Zero for the DS, which more closely resembled PSO, but wasn't quite as polished as Universe. I liked these games and thought they were good for what they were, but they just didn't capture the same magic that PSO had for me. But then, something happened. It appeared on the distant horizon, a small glimmer of hope that grew into a flash of jubilation. Fantasy Star Online 2. It was going to be another MMO was set to capture the magic of the original. It was a new story, but with familiar elements, and it was going to get an English release? Oh, I kid you not. I had never cried at the announcement of a video game, but I shed tears over this one. Oh, yes, please give it to me. No, God, please, no, no. PSO was definitely one of my favorites, but I fully understand that a great deal of that favoritism is an emotional response. I grew so attached to this blank slate of a character named Death Scythe, a character that I named after an anime I really liked, a character that would go on to make different incarnations of him in various other PSO games I played throughout the years. This game meant a lot to me, and while I'm sure I could pick up Fancy Star Online 2 and go through the long, arduous process that people have made in giving it a working English patch, I don't think I will anytime soon, because that game wasn't the one I played before, it's something different. But, you know, maybe someday I'll try it out. I actually did find a private server for PSO and have been playing it regularly, even recreating Death Scythe the best I could. I couldn't fit his whole name in though for some reason, so I just shortened it to Scythe, but without the C so that I could also get my specific Hunter ID to go with him. But it is what it is. I also know that this private server won't last forever. Just like any other private server has done this, eventually it gets shut down due to Sega or because the creators don't want to manage it anymore. But for now, it's fun. It's definitely a lot less hacker-filled like the original PSO server, so that's nice. Eh, at least in my experience. We'll see what happens. Nothing lasts forever, no matter what kind of slogan the game publishers will give you. So don't be afraid to make memories of your games and cherish them. Because those are eternal. Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed